ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನಕಲ್ಯರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮವಿತ್ವರ ಶ್ರೀ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ಸದ್ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಯೋಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚ ಮಲಂ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪಾತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲೀನಾಸ್ಮಿ ಹರಿಯೋ ಇನ್ ಮೆನಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕೋರ್ಸಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಗುರುದೇವ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ ಋಷೀಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮುನೀಸ್ we have heard a statement that world is an illusion it perplexes us that what i live every day how it can be an illusion i live or lead a life every day which is so real which is so authentic to my mind and how is it that these realized souls are calling it as an illusion there is a need to think on this particular statement that world is an illusion because in that statement lies the upcoming sutra of patanjali maharaj let us first understand by taking a simple analogy which we see every day which is unfortunately not needed but to keep ourselves in the state of illusion everyone in the morning the first thing what he does is he sees his face in the mirror we watch ourselves in the mirror and as a matter of factly we look at the image which we consider as real take the help of the image do our beautification or whatever we call it and carry on with our activities when we see an image in the mirror is it not that the image is there it is there it is very much there that is why we look into the mirror at the same time and simultaneously we are aware that it is an image not me the question is what is that is standing behind in the mirror at a equal distance opposite to the mirror which i am seeing as an image which does not exist so there are couple of things very clear in our mind that image has no existence one to still the image is perceived and three for the image to be perceived 
I need a medium to create the image and an organ to perceive the image. To this extent, there should be absolutely no doubt in the mind. This is because of the reflected rays of light. This is called reflection, reflected rays of light. There's something called angle of incidence, angle of reflection, which is normally the same. That's a physics part of it. When I dip the wooden stick into the water, <clears throat> it appears to have shifted and changed the direction and happens to be shorter than what it actually is. This is refraction. The medium changed from air to water and the image changed. Image changed in its shape. It distorted the original into a distorted image. A mirror gives the same image. Air and water interference gives a distorted image. Both are images, both are perceived as real. Simultaneously, we know that both are images and distortions. In the similar manner, everything that we see outside is an image. Perceived by the mind, with the help of an organ, Indriya, called Chakshu, the eyes. If seeing is the test of reality, then the image in the mirror should be considered as absolute real, which we don't. We call it the image. Because I'm aware that it is an image, I'm able to differentiate between the image in the mirror and myself. But because we all have agreed to our perception of world as real, there is no debate about the reality of that. Does that mean that nothing exists in the world? It's all imaginary? No. Whatever exists there is perceived as the world by us. We are coming to a very subtle difference. Existence of things in the world are not denied at all. What is denied is the existence of the worldly objects creating an impression in the mind through the act of perception that is being denied. Let's take a very concrete example. We all know as a student of physics, we see colors in this universe. My dear, variety of colors, a riot of colors. The physics tells us that color is nothing else but a vibration of a certain frequency. That means when I perceive a red color, it is perceived as a red color, actually it is a sound, it is a frequency of a certain sound, of a certain magnitude. It's called spectra, spectrum or spectra. A particular frequency making me feel that it is red color. There is no color, there's no redness in the frequency. Let's take it a little deeper. And then I see a human being in front of me. The majority of it is a carbon particle. It's an organic body, mainly predominated by the carbon particle. I don't perceive a carbon particle. I perceive a human being there. So this clarifies the point that what I perceive may not be what it is there. 
the perception can be distortive in nature it is generally all our perceptions being similar we find world is an amicable thing to our perception everybody looks red color as a red color because everyone is perceiving the frequencies as colors we all agree to the existence of a color which actually is not there a pure physicist would look at a color as a frequency but he would be an exception amongst the mankind because majority of the people would call it as a red color if majority of people agreed on a particular perception does not mean that is the truth because majority of people agreed once upon a time that earth is a square and you will fall off if you walk that doesn't mean earth was square it was different it was round or whatever spherical means at an individual level perception of the things around me may not be the thing in itself the reason why i am not able to see the thing in itself is because the consciousness which is employed in understanding this perception is outwardly oriented and seeping through the indriyas this consciousness which is outwardly oriented through the seepage of indriyas is called parag chetana outwardly consciousness if for some reason one exceptional individuals one exceptional individual tries to get this consciousness from outward to inward and changes it its direction towards inside inwardly looking consciousness it is called centripetal or pratyachetana paragchetana pratyachetana centrifugal force centripetal force once the consciousness is directed in words the perception changes we are discussing a very subtle point about how the jeevan mukta looks towards the world we are stupidly trying to evaluate gurudeva as a centrifugal force and then we say he was such a great man he was such a nice man my dear sir evaluation of a jeevan mukta through our eyes can never be appropriate because we are all outwardly focused while guru deva or the realized souls are inwardly focused so what they see in the world or what they see at the world is different than what we see the world a grown up teacher in the nursery looks at the small boys and girls who have come in the nursery as small boys while the boys look at the teacher as wow my teacher is so beautiful tall knowledgeable this that everything that's children's child's perception 
So we have never seen the world the way it is till now. We have had a distorted, illusory version of the world so far. It may be shocking to know, but it is a reality that we have perceived this world as illusion. And this illusory world, humongous amount of fights are on. For a central, for the inwardly oriented consciousness of a realized soul, when he looks at these fights, he laughs. Couple of children keep fighting about the pebbles and the colored glasses. For the adult, it is a child's play. So people of Gurudeva's stature with consciousness constantly inward oriented and stabilized sthiratvam, they look at the world and the constituents and the people like us as illusory world residents, squabbling with each other and with oneself for the sake of illusory desires, because illusory objects cannot have real desire. Utopian city and utopian objects. Mind well, we have not denied the existence of things outside. We are denying the perception of the existence of the things outside. So when the consciousness is inwardly oriented or if it is in the form of Pratyak Chetana, then the perception of the world in the real sense comes to them. The real picture of the world is thrown open in front of them. If a physicist or a chemist can look at an object as interplay of minute particles like proton, electron, and neutron, which are normally not visible to the eye, but it looks to them, it is just a change of perception. A face, when it is being operated by a plastic surgeon, his perception of the face is a connective tissue that is being operated upon because his perception at that point of time is it is a tissue to be operated upon while for a lady it is a face of beauty what changed is the perception the face per se is as it is so it is the perception with the help of indriyas being interpreted by the mind that creates a illusory world which does not exist. That is why it is called mithya. Mithya meaning not untrue. Mithya is not false. It is distorted myth. The word myth has come from mithya. What it means is, it shall continue to be real as long as it has not been sublated by inwardly looking consciousness. So the world did exist the way it exists for us, even for Gurudeva before the realization. And this process of knowing the world in its reality, moving away from the illusory state, is sadhana. Sadhana is nothing but a vigorous and sincere attempt made with the help of mind. And it's penetrating aspect called buddhi to make the consciousness look inwards and 
focus it at the center. That is called centripetal force always focuses at the center. So bringing the centrifugal powers back into the centripetal center is the sadhana. And the key to this sadhana is look inwards and concentrate. Presently, we are looking outwards and scattered. Mind well, the scattering that we have in the present world, which is on the outside things, in the outside world itself, the, an attempt should be made to stop the scattering. In our transactional world or Vavharika Vishwa, the job that we are doing, the role that we are performing, even at those places, we have tremendous amount of distortion centrifugally. We do not focus on one aspect of one act that we are doing. We don't breathe normally. We don't work with full concentration even to achieve the transactional, transactional world results. We do not study Patanjali Yoga Shastra by sitting at one place for a sufficient period of time so that we understand the deeper aspect because our energy, our consciousness is outwardly oriented and constantly flitting. So it goes without saying that the key lies in two aspects. One, concentration. The sinkanan, the prominent word in the art of sadhana is concentration, ekagrata. If you are listening to something, ekagrata of the ears to the words that are coming inside, nothing should disturb except what you are focused on. Not only that, even the act of eating food requires immense concentration for the act to be complete. Observe the mind while doing any of the mundane activities. You will observe that it is never in the act that you are doing. That is called a zero concentration. We do things habitually. We wear our trousers in the morning. We do not concentrate. We just do it habitually. Similarly, we drive habitually. That's how we are never aware of the steering wheel. Because we have looked, never looked at it. Mechanically, we have been working. A mechanical outlook means the mind is not applied there. Application of the buddhi in the act that we are doing with utmost concentration is the key to the success in that even transactional aspect of the work that we are doing. We don't read with concentration. We don't see with concentration. We don't enjoy with the concentration. Because of umpteen number of births and the practices that we have followed, the flitting nature of consciousness has become our nature. That needs to be hammered and changed slowly, step by step, through what is called as abhyasa. So concentration is abhyasam. Failing and repeating it again, failing and repeating it again is abhyasam. So there cannot be a separation of sadhana between day-to-day -day world and the practice world. 
we are trying to stupidly and foolishly separate sadhana between vyavaharik and adhyatmic sphere it cannot be so because the concentration that is required in sadhana is the same concentration that is required in transactional world if i am able to have a very steady and calm mind in my day to day activities it is the same act of steady and calm mind that i am going to use when i am going to sit for meditation meditation is a state and a state is available and should be available at all the places for all the times there is an inherent hurry inbuilt in our actions which abridges the required extent of the work is thwarted by that hurry and a shanta mind causes that hurry prashanta mind does not have the hurry yet it does everything on time gurudeva is a live lab laboratory attended enormous amount of satsangas with alarming punctuality without any commotion in the mind because full concentration in whatever he was doing mahatma gandhi is an ideal example to be observed when it comes to the ekagrata irrespective of the task that is undertaken whether it was writing a letter to the lieutenant governor general or if it is an act of tending to the goat at both the places he had similar and enormous amount of concentration in the act that he was doing mind well ekagrata presupposes one act one object one mind one organ at a time so that means doing one thing at a time is concentration multitasking is stupidity unitasking is concentration work has to be done sequentially not parallelly taking baths listening to the music talking to somebody this is not the way the bath is taken people used to watch with alarming curiosity when mahatma gandhi used to take bath one of the senior literature person i have read has made a comment that bapu's bath was as if he is not going to take bath again with so much of concentration a mundane activity like bath what it means is what you do do you know daily life is not different than what you have to do in the adhyatmic life which means the concentration galore is at all the places and should precede each and every activity irrespective of whether it is vyavaharik vishwa or adhyatmik vishwa such a consciousness which is centripetally oriented which is called as pratyak chetana inwardly looking consciousness so concentration in the outer as well as inner world and then slowly extinguishing the outer world and moving towards the inner world is the sadhana in yoga shastra and when such inward looking consciousness starts moving inside all the obstacles in the yoga 
आर रिमूव तत् प्रत्यग चेतना अधिगमो देन बाय गोइंग इनवर्ड्स प्रत्यग चेतना अधिगमो बाय गोइंग इनवर्ड्स द इनवर्ड लुकिंग कॉन्शियसनेस अपि अंतराय अभावश्च देयर विल बी अभाव एब्सेंस ऑफ अंतराय ऑब्स्टेकल्स दैट मींस if the consciousness is not directed inwards there shall be lots of obstacles the question then is what are those obstacles ke antaraya ye chittasya vikshepa outward looking consciousness is called vikshepa kshapa vikshepa kshapa means to project kshepanastra प्रोजेक्ट विक्षेप विशेषेण क्षिप्त थी ए डेलिबरेट थ्रोइंग आउट ऑफ द माइंड इज कॉल्ड विक्षेप सो चित्त हैज टू थिंग्स आइदर इट इज लुकिंग आउटवर्ड्स व्हिच इज कॉल्ड विक्षेप और इट इज लुकिंग इनवर्ड्स व्हिच इज कॉल्ड प्रत्यग चेतना the one which is looking inwards called pratyaka chetana is now directed in opposite direction inside because that is where a curtain called adhyanam is there to be penetrated so only a inward looking consciousness can penetrate and tear apart the curtain or the veil of adhyana for the atma anubhuti outward looking is all vikshep this obstacle that a yogi gets or even we get yogi is trying to bring his consciousness inside and focus it on a particular point we are trying to focus the consciousness outside but again to focus on a particular point it is a different fact that we do not focus but our whole attempt is let us take a very simple example i want to make money even on this materialistic ambition we do not have sufficient focus those who have sufficient focus they becomes billionaires the result is they become billionaires but the act is because of the focus and the concentration a scientist becomes a nobel laureate because he keeps on studying abhyasam with full focus on the subject that he has undertaken till the point he discovers something and gets a nobel prize for it why all are not nobel laureates why everybody is not having the same kind of result that is because he lacks the concentration so even in the outer world there are only two types of people one who focus or concentrate and those who don't those who concentrate fully at 100% strength become the successful people whether it is a successful politician or a successful research scientist or a successful actor they have what they call tenacity of purpose tenacity of purpose is nothing else but concentration till it fructifies a successful chef is the one who focuses on the dish that he prepares to an extent that it is made the way it is supposed to be make, made and that's how it creates enormous interest to the tongues of so many of the recipients and he becomes a famous chef when it comes to the obstacles of the concentration whether you are concentrating outward in the material world or inward for the inward focus these obstacles are common and these obstacles are nine different obstacles nava yoga mal yoga pratipaksha yoga antaraya ityabhidhiyante ete chitta vikshepe for the vikshep of the chitta or the outward throwing of the consciousness mind well two important things to be noted 
consciousness shall be getting obstructions only when it is thrown outside not when it is thrown inside so none of these obstacles will be affecting a realized person or a yogi while a common man and an attempting yogi shall come across these obstacles the kevali or the kevala gnana prapta yogi shall not have these obstacles a jivan mukta shall not have these obstacles how many are there there are nine in numbers in other words there are nine things that we suffer from if the its nine are removed we are the real man as gurudeva calls it the walking god on earth i am a man today of a fallen man i am a lower intellect i am not a higher intellect the difference between a man and the god is nothing else but the god has no obstacles i have all the nine obstacles so studying the obstacles is extremely important irrespective of whether you are a student of yoga shastra karma yoga jnana yoga or bhakti yoga they are serially organized according to their importance as we move forward the importance becomes enormous for the inward movement nav antaraya chittasya vikshepah these nine obstacles are called chitta vikshep vikshep means outward throwing of consciousness in simpler words mind projected in the world is vikshep which is of nine types the first is called vyadhi 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 means disease very very critical and very very important for us in both the worlds the outer as well as inner world we cannot call ourselves sadhaka if we have no shame of even caring for our own health the very fact that you neglect your health and trying to study bhagavad gita is a contradiction par excellence shariram adyam khalu dharma sadhanam khalu real dharma sadhanam for the dharma or for the study that we are undertaking a real sadhana is shariram adyam after that mind is there but shariram adyam so if as a sadhaka whatever type of yoga that you may be attempting whatever sadhana that you are attempting in fact even if you are not attempting the sadhana and were trying to be successful in the material world the instrument has to be perfect in balance and vigor one of the reason why nothing goes inside the head i am not able to sit for a long time in sadhana i am not able to read any book i don't feel like reading the upanishad i don't feel like it's too dry too complicated to i want easy thing this is an indication that vyadhi is there in the shariram and when you say disease that means health is not only disease of free life but health is a state by itself it's unfortunate that we do not know that health is something which is there to be enjoyed being healthy is not absence of disease it is a wrong notion in the mind that we carry absence of disease of course is expected but that does not make you healthy health is when health is enjoyed by the mind the health resides in mind exhibited in the body the disease manifests in the body originates in the mind 
Patanjali Maharaj entirely believes that the sharir and its health is entirely originating and dependent upon mind. That is why Vyadhi or the diseased body is supposed to be Chittasya Vikshepaha. Patanjali Maharaj is not pointing towards any of the anatomical organs as Vyadhi. He says, if Chitta Vikshep is there, you will have disease. Vyadhi. It goes without saying that according to the Vyasa Bhasham, as well as according to the Tattva Vaisharadhi of Vachaspati Mishra, Vyadhi has been defined as a Dhatu Rasakarana Vaishamyam. The body, mind well, Ayurveda is associated medical branch of Vedas. Upavedas. And it draws its inspiration from Sankhya philosophy. That is why along with Sattva Rajatama, the Tridosha theory of Vata Pitta Kapha, which is called as a Shakti Rupa Dravya. Mind well, the basic concept of Ayurveda is there is nothing in this world existing except Shakti or Urja. Shakti manifests in different forms. The energy that is existing in this world of creation, the whole world is created in two parts. One is matter, another is energy. It sounds like a new discovery of Einstein, but the Upanishadas declared it first as prana and rai. Rai and prana, matter and the energy. So the prana is not breath. Read Swami Vivekananda's Yoga Sutra. In the next sutras, he is going to talk about it. Prana is not breath. Prana rides the breath. Prana is everywhere. In fact, there is nothing in this universe except prana, energy and matter. The matter is energized. The body that is made up of matter is energized by the prana which comes inside this matter through the breath, the shwasa. So shwasa is the horse, the carrier for the pranas. Once they come inside, they take charge of the entire body in the form of pancha pranas and pancha upapranas. Prana, vyana, samana, udana, apana. At different places, they act. The nature is same. Functionally, there are different, so different names and different functions for them. Through this, they take the help of consumed food. And the consumed food creates what is called as Shakti Yukta Dravya. Shakti Yukta means the food that is consumed is combined with the prana. The modern science calls it oxygenation. And this prana, along with the consumed food, create what is called as tissues. The muscle tissue, the bone tissue, etc. The tissues are called as ashtadhatu. Rasa, rakta, mausa, ved, asti, majja, shukra and... Mahadhatu called Ojasa. The Ojasa can be very loosely and correctly defined as immunity. Ojasa is immunity. A yogi has a very high Ojas in his body, so he never falls sick and he is lustrous. Swami Vivekananda had golden hue on the body. A very attractive face like Gurudeva. We don't call Gurudeva beautiful the way we call a lady or a human being beautiful. No, he was attractive. Krishna. 
one who attracts is Krishna. That is because of the Ojas, the Shakti Yukta Dravya. So Vyadhi has been defined as Vyadhi Dhatu Rasakarana Vaishamyam. Imbalance of Ashta Dhatu, which we just now described, or Shad Rasa. Shad Rasa, Madhur Amla Lavana Katu, Tikta Kashaya. The sweet, the sour, the salt, the pungent, the bitter and the astringent. These are shadrasas. Shadrasa and ashtadhatu. So we consume shadrasas. Ashtadhatus are produced and they are energized by the prana. If shadrasas are correctly, properly and in proper quantities consumed, consumed from the original source. For example, amla, a sour thing. We have amlaka fruit. It is called amlaka because of amla. So whatever amla rasa we require should be coming from amlaka fruit. Unfortunately, some stupid guy sitting in a restaurant takes this amalakam, makes something out of it by putting a lot of other things into it and because it entertains the tongue, we eat it. That is, and there and there itself, the purpose of the diet is defeated. When we say shuddha sattvika ahara, it should be as much as possible in the original form. One of the reasons why most of the rushis and munis before the state of realization, depended on sattvika, ahara, meat, limited ahara, gorakshanathas, goraksha samvita, and siddha siddhanta paddhati. Swami Swatmaram, Hatha Yoga, enormous focus is there on the diet. One of the primary requirement of the diet is not to have vyadhi. And one of the primary requirement is it should be from the nature. As much possible from the nature. The fruit comes from the nature. Concoctions, recipes made by the man. The one who handles the food transfers his state in the food. That is what is not written anywhere, but we have to believe in Agam or Shabda Pramana. And Shabda Pramana is Ramakrishna Paramahosa. Purer the body, purer the food required. In a black, in, on a black cloth, a blot is not seen. On a clean white cloth, even a small dot can be seen. So purer the body, more you'll be affected by the food. So all these sadhakas, they get immediately affected by the food because if the chitta is more pure, a slight deviation in the food matters. So a yogi or a sadhaka has to be very careful about what he eats. Why? Because he has to keep this instrument in the best and the utmost condition. Whatever Prarabdha has in terms of Jati and Ayu, let it come. But till then, till the time of death has come, the body cannot be subjected to any disease because that is a deviation. Since the diet is taken in the required form as meant for that particular yoni, we do not find animals getting sick because they have not changed the diet. Their diet is precisely what is meant for them because they have not concocted the diet we have stupidly concocted to a great extent. So a yogi cannot happen to have food from adulterated hands, certainly not from the restaurants. We ought to take in mind and give a careful attention to what you eat. In the home, we eat the home food because it is expected 
to be made with a niswarthi bhavana. It very rarely happens that a mother has done cook some food or feed the child and the child is gone sick. Very rare because the mother has got complete understanding that it's meant for my baby and she should be healthy. Unfortunately, as we grow as adults, we fight with each other, the husband and the wife, and then wife cooks something and the husband eats it in huff, in anger. Anything that is consumed with commotion of mind, the food shall not be giving its desired end result. So, shad rasa yukta, as much as natural, in the minimum required quantity. Modern science calls it, calls it calorie proportionate. If you're a sedentary worker, you can't be having more than 15 to 1800 calories. This is what the medicine says. The logic or the sadhaka, what he should be doing is meet ahar. Ayurveda says, do not eat more than three-fourths of requirement of your stomach. No uttejakadravya. We are all addicted to tea and coffee. These substances can stimulate the nerves. We do not want undue stimulation of nerves. We get addicted to that. The drugs like heroin, they excite to enormous extent, but at a lower level, even the coffee, the theophylline and the caffeine does the same job. A yogi, till the point of real post realization, there are no bondages. Swami Vivekananda used to eat machi, the fish. Gurudeva ate all kind of food. Mind well, do not apply those rules to us because they are Post-realization, pre-realization, the diet is very important. At all times, if the body is sound, nothing aches. You are a lean and a supple body, flexible enough, doing pranayama and yoga, then the body is fit to undertake the sadhana. Whatever is given as food, Presuming it to be the reincarnation of Brahma, Brahmarpanam. So, for the Vaishwanara, even the food that we are taking should be taken in absolute solitude when nobody is watching what you are eating because majority of the yogis do not want the eyesight. Mind well, the Pishacha Yoni eats the food with the help of eyes. A sight on the food is equally important the way the hand that made the food is important. So, Anna Prashanam is a vidhi in Hinduism. It's not a restaurant activity as in West. So we should respect the timing for the food. We should respect the food that has come to us. We should worship the food that has come to us. In fact, the word annam has come from very important etymology. That which comes humbly and respectfully in front of the mouth is called annam. So that's why if it is samish ahara, non-vegetarian food, that means the food that has come hasn't come with the happiness. It has come with anguish and the pain of the animal that has been slaughtered somewhere. And a mass scale slaughtering done by a stupid organization creates a brand food and we eat that food called KFC. I'm not against any economic activity, but for the sadhaka, this is very, very critical. Even the statistical record of crimes in India has proven a fact that most of the Jains who do not eat onion garlic also and are pure vegetarian 
we have the least amount of criminal activities happening in them there could be economic frauds and financial frauds but the physical criminality is very less because the animalistic tendencies go down shuddha satvik ahar shad rasapurna which will not lead to imbalance of ashta dhatu the question is in the modern world how do we translate this and the translation is very simple the food has to be satvika means it should not dominate in any of one of these rasas one two it should be limited in quantity three it cannot be made by anybody other than you yourself or a very close relation like wife three it should be as natural as possible so it should be dominated by fruits and vegetables which the modern science calls as food pyramid to be filled at the bottom by fruits and vegetables in the most natural form at an appropriate time in the reasonable quantity made by a person who is selfless in nature or you yourself because you will never want to harm yourself such a food is consumed prashanam with a vidhi what is the vidhi because since it is a yajna the yajna cannot be done under commotion you can't do a puja under commotion so when you are absolutely not in a physical as well as mental frame of consuming the food do not the modern science calls it binge eating because you are thinking too much you are eating too much that's not the way the mind has to be calm and peaceful while consuming the food only when you do this you start getting a feel inside your body that you are bursting with energy you feel you are not having any more alasya in the body you feel like constantly doing something the energy abounds in the body that is called a state of health absence of disease is not at all a criteria for a healthy body and mind well there is no way a mind can be separated from a body and a healthy body and a healthy mind both are needed but if we go by patanjali maharaj it is the healthy mind that is more important because healthy mind does keep healthy body so the way precautions are taken to keep the body healthy the precaution should be taken to keep the mind healthy because mind e also has ahar the shariram has ahar the body has the mind has ahar the mind's ahar is to take the inputs through the panchendriyas so if they are not healthy the mind will become unhealthy so the eyes are meant for observing the beauty of god's world without any malice without any jealousy without any anger towards anybody with love abounding everyone is to be loved the irritating and obstinate husband is to be loved the irritating and oft penetrating wife is to be loved a unscrupulous obstinate haughty boss is to be loved when the indriyas input is coming in the most healthy manner the mind is bound to be healthy one of the healthy food for the mind is adhyatmam so upanishada bhagavad gita bhakti shastra name of krishna name of gurudeva name of chanting of ram krishna hari 
हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे हरे दीज आर दर्ड्स वेन एन अपनाउंस बाय द माउथ एंड हर्ड बाय द इयर्स द माइंड बिकम्स हेल्दी a healthier positive mind bubbling with energy associated with equally healthy shariram because diet influences thoughts thoughts influence diet and thoughts influence behavior mind well every activity that we do every food that we eat every thought that we think has to be satvika the key lies in increasing satvikata sattva guna ask a question to yourself whether am i increasing my sattva guna i became angry sorry sir tamo guna is on rise drop it i feel like there is too much of work today sir stop it rajoguna is increasing shanta rasai sattva guna do work work relentlessly but one work at a time with full concentration till the desired result is obtained equally and ably supported by a healthy body shariram आद्यम खलु धर्म साधन वेन दिस इज डन देन अष्ट धातु षड रस आर इन एप्सोल्यूट बैलेंस साम्यता इफ इट इज नॉट इन बैलेंस वैषम्यता देन धातु रस करण वैषम्यम व्याधि एंड माइंड वेल व्याधि अकॉर्डिंग टू पतंजलि महाराज इज इन द माइंड the body just suffers vyadhi originates in mind in fact ayurveda as well as patanjali maharaj as yogis disposition towards the health is keep the mind healthy body shall follow there are incidences which i have come across while reading where in the olden days when tuberculosis called rajayakshma was a life threatening disease one of the yogi who got afflicted with it incidentally he was the head of department of the philosophy in allahabad university he is rever reverentially is called as gurudev ranade he cured his tuberculosis by simply 3 months lying in a pit focusing on sun through his mind he cured tuberculosis which proves the fact that all diseases can be cured and prevented by a healthy mind unfortunately if the shariram gets the vyadhi manam can be used to cure that vyadhi but if the manam gets the vyadhi it is very difficult to cure the ever rising percentage of depressions in the world which was a disease of the west so far which is predominating now in india youngsters falling prey to the depression a small amount of seclusion inside the home because of a virus creating an enormous number of cases of mental illnesses indicates that manasya vyadhi is going to be a very important aspect in our life and if the mind is vyadhi grasta there is no way any sadhana can be made to lead the normal materialistic life is difficult where is the question of spiritual life so focus on one thing the way of keeping mind vyadhi mukta is to have the mind which does not carry garbage and dust inside it and the garbage is envy jealousy anger prejudice how long you are going to carry in your mind the impression that my husband is a bad person my wife is a bad person how long you are going to carry the thing in mind that the world has not been good to me how long you are going to carry the impression that you know i have been always sidelined 
nobody is sidelining you nobody is troubling you it is your own creation either created in the past by the actions even amidst the turbulent flow of water in the river you can still be calm in fact that is the sadhana make the mind healthy make the shariram healthy be careful about the inputs that are coming to both of them the input for the body is shwas and ahar input for the mind is the the perceptions or the stimuli coming from the sense organs just be careful do not let anyone enter inside unless verified and checked for the credentials before lifting up that particular glass of alcohol ask a question why am i doing it how long am i going to cheat myself that i'm enjoying the weekends with the friends it is called swaprataarana self cheating and how do you come to know what is right and what is wrong always test it again the testing stone of gurudeva or the realized soul any of the saintly person i would definitely indulge in alcohol if gurudeva does it he doesn't i will not how many people gurudeva was envious of none i shall be none how active gurudeva was i shall be there was no alasya with gurudeva i shall not be lazy this is proper utilization of the freedom that is given to us kriyamana swatantrya so that is why amongst the nine obstacle patanjali maharaj has put the first as the vyadhi so if you are vyadhi grast forget any sadhana meaning meaning in other words if your mind is not healthy if the body is not healthy and the first body and then mind if these are not healthy any undertaking whatsoever sir you may do will be futile that is why n number of people ask a question sir i am trying to do the meditation but somehow i am not able to sit in that position i am not able to meditate you will not be the basic prerequisite for the school is notebook and the pen if that is not there what are you going to do in the school in the same manner if the body is not healthy if the mind is not healthy what exercise can you undertake sir you cannot And that is the reason we must take care of this to avoid the vyadhi so only when one starts working on his body and on his mind we do see many many people devoted to adhyatma or the bhagavad gita coming for the classes not keeping their health up to the mark it is a very very serious prejudice towards a serious Uh, mockery towards the whole exercise we are not trying to create a gymnasium inside the spiritual school but swami shivananda the diksha guru of our own gurudeva had a band of disciples but every morning's routine was exercise exercise the body in the morning for about one hour so that it is ready for remaining 23 hours which should be dedicated towards mental purification through the actions that we are taking mind well everybody is doing some act right from bill gates to ourselves we have all work all the work can be taken as god's task the only aim of the work that we do is purification of mind creation of sattva guna so with that we will be able to tackle the first vyadhi or the first obstacle there are nine of them we shall see remaining eight in the next session hari om om purnamada purnamada
ಪೂರ್ಣಂ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಉದಕ್ಷತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿ ಹರಿ ಶ್ರೀಗೃಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಸಂಜಯ್ ಜೀ ವಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಮಿನಟ್ ಇನ್ ಕೇಸ್ ಅನಿ ಸಾಧಕ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅನಿ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಸಂಜಯ್ ಜೀ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಹವ್ ಕಾನ್ಸಂಟ್ರೇಟೆಡ್ ಆನ್ ವ್ಯಾಥಿ ಒಳ್ಳಿ ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ನೈನ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ವಾಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಸ್ ಮೀನ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಬಿಚುಲಿ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಮೆನ್ಶನ್ಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ಏಗಾಗ್ರದ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ನಾರ್ಮಲಿ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಬಿಚುಲಿ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟ್ರೈನ್ಡ್ ಓರ್ ಟ್ರೈನ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಮಲ್ಟಿ ಟಾಸ್ಕಿಂಗ್ i mean even if you take your own children also you are also molding them to do multitasking now uh, if you are if uh, one is uh, following this uh, patanjali is uh, this thing egagrada then they won't be able to uh, live up to the expectation now the today's uh, world right can you can you give me an example of a multitasking multitasking uh, there are many i mean i can i can any I mean, one example any one example now if you, if you are uh, going to kitchen and uh, making something simultaneously you are doing listening you simultaneously you are watching whatsapp all those things are happening yes i mean while driving also you are some message comes your attention is going to that so yes. you're thinking on that you are for, i mean the signal thing is mechanical Okay. See, the thing is, when we say multitasking, we need to understand the difference between habituated thing and multitasking. When you drive to the office, the gears and the steering and everything is habituated. So what yes. happens is, that being an act of habituation, it happens mechanically because we are no more interested in focusing in them because they are mechanical acts and there is nothing else expected from them. Once this mechanical acts are happening habituated acts are happening the main course of action that you are doing needs to be focused upon for example when you are in the kitchen even if you are not attending to whatsapp or any other thing are you not walking is not the lady walking from this place to that place taking that container but all these are habituated things her focus is in in proper quantities of condiments that are taken the dish that is the flame then that so what is happening that all that constitutes one action the parcels of the action are constituents of one action let us take example when you are reading upanishada the book is in front of you you want the page to be properly opened you want your finger to be at the line which you are reading all these are associate part and parcel things of the entire act those are required as a part of an act but those which are not required for example your you are cooking something in the kitchen there is no need to attend to the whatsapp or one thing is when you are cooking something if you are able to for example something is simmering in water in the kitchen it's going to take half an hour the pressure cooker is going to take 10 minutes now you are not supposed to attend to it anymore now you can take the withdraw the attention and look towards the whatsapp but be in whatsapp what you are reading the problem is when the whatsapp is in the hand another hand is on the ladle third hand is something this is called multitasking this is diffraction the consciousness of the concentration then is getting thrown into two three parts this is as far as transactional world is concerned what happens when you sit in meditation now here there are no multiple acts there is only one act because there is only one object one mind one focus and one thought there is no scope whatsoever to do multitasking in concentration when it become, when it comes to inward concentration in the transactional world also if you are taking bath it would involve starting the water maybe taking the tumbler full of water on the body but these are part and parcels of that act but the overall act is taking bath you should be completely immersed in the bath 
of course you will be picking up the soap of course you will be rubbing it on the body it is part and parcel of the entire act called bath those are not multitasking but while taking the bath my ears are also listening to some music that is happening there this is called multitasking which is not required because it will divide the attention between bath and the auditory stimuli this is this is diverting the concentration now the concentration is trying to focus on two objects and whole idea is if the concentration is focused on one object then the object fructifies if you are eating food in eating food you have at least there is a roti there is a sabji there is something these are parts of the food they are not multitasking it is a part the whole thing is called food taking so that's not multitasking you may say oh they have also given chapati no that's a part but while eating the food i am watching the television the visual stimuli are taking something else as input the oral stimuli the tongue is taking some other input there will be diffraction and let me take you to a further theory the person who dr luke who got the nobel prize in our own body there is something called gate control theory supposing you got a pinch on your thigh and simultaneously you had an ant bite on your other thigh what will happen to the pain you will be surprised the pain gets divided the pain from the pinch and simultaneously the pain from the ant bite on the other thigh they get 50 50% attention that is why you always observe whenever you hit your leg or the shin to some solid object it pains at that point of time you try to pinch at some other place your pain will come go down observe yourself that is called gate control theory because mind cannot concentrate on one point now the concentration taken by two points i am going to die this feeling takes the complete concentration of a person who meets with an accident so only when he become becomes conscious and comes to know that he is still alive then he starts getting pain for the fracture not at the time when the accident happens i have seen it as a doctor closely what it means is concentration gets divided into the number of attempts you do that is why multitasking leads to an habituated uh, division of concentration while tasking makes you habituated to concentration so do all your daily transactional activities with full concentration it helps enormously when you go inside although outside concentration is 1% compared to the concentration that is required inside hari om hari om uh sanjay ji uh, you know you were talking of ojas uh, yes now uh, ojas is referred in many uh, you know yogic texts and uh, you know people do keshri mudra to ojas yes. fall and before that you talked about um, you know the intermingling of the uh, the you know you mentioned shwas shadrasa and uh, also how it is formed can you just explain that once again with the dhatus yes The, the inputs that this body gets are in the form of air through nose that is basically because the shwas and prashwas through that the prana comes inside prana means energy this body is nothing else but matter rai so this rai requires ahara that comes inside the shwas prashwas that comes through the nose ahara it needs essence after metabolism along with the prana they form the carrier of energy and they spread throughout the body and that is how we work mm -hmm. the energy that comes even to speak is coming because of the prana and the rai so when the food goes inside the food is supposed to create the tissue which are ashtadhatu ashtadhatu means tissue the muscles the nerves the bones these are the ashtadhatus and shadarasa is the content constituent of the ahara that we take now if the ahara is balanced then the ashtadhatus get the balanced diet that they need for their functioning so if any of the dhatu is missing from the diet then the tissues suffer that is why if supposing somebody takes too much of amlam in his diet he suffers from pitta dosha because one dominated other is absent that is why all the shadarasa shadarasa yukta it should be now where do you get this shadarasa yukta ahara usually the fruits 
and the vegetables are properly balanced in these shada rasas now we destroy those rasas by cooking by adding the spice and the oil and what not and 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 doing even there is something called nishiddha combination for example you must have heard of great swami shankara acharya called mahaperiyava chandrashekar saraswati maharaj of kanchi who lived for about 100 years he never allowed anybody to drink coffee because he said milk is white coffee is black even the varna bhed varna nishiddha also should not be combined i'm just giving an example and mind well he was a realized soul i have more faith in realized souls word than even medicine because they are epitome of knowledge so what i am trying to say is if shadarasas come in the original form if a shwas a prashwas goes in a proper manner which for a yogi it goes the body automatically gets what is called as ashta dhatu sampannata pushtata that is why a yogi's body who is lean has got enormous amount of shine on it and the ojas that we talk about is essence of the food is digestive juices ashta dhatu required that and then essence of that again is stored in the body in the form of virya or ojas now ojas if it is virya then what about women because we normally have a habit of calling seminal fluid or testicular fluid as ojas it is of course ojas but ojas is the essence of the food that ultimately is there in the form of protective force throughout the body which we call immunity so lesser the immunity lesser the ojas so ojas could be affected because of faulty digestion faulty food that we undertake and another thing is any of the organ tissues that we have ashta dhatu if you excessively use them there will be a problem with the body in fact the modern theory of carcinoma or the cancer is excessive use of any organ for example too much of smoking leads to excessive use of the lungs to defend against the carcinogen it leads to the carcinoma excessive amount of uh, smoked fish the japanese people eat lot of smoked fish they are the people with highest incidence of esophageal cancer the uttar pradesh bhaiya they use a very tight langot which leads to lot of friction that is one of the cause of testicular cancer in up people so what i am trying to say that excessive use of any organ should not be there diet has to be balanced shwasa praswasa has to be balanced with these alone mind also gets control because one who is exercising this controls on diet and the breathing automatically learns to exercise control on the mind also are you uh yes anji ji so i understood that part i just want a little more clarification on ojas because in the yogic practices a lot of uh, you know taking the seminal fluid and uh, you know yes, uh, giving yes. is taking upward so that yes yes uh, yes you know and then they say the result is so just a little yeah ojas actually they see in in tantricism in in vamachara also and in tantricism mainly in in shaiva paddhati what we do is the virya that is there although they say that virya is taken up medically nothing like that can happen from seminal fluid from the from the seminal tube it cannot just come back what they mean is when you have normally the ida and pingala as your nadis these nadis are anatomically not visible they are not dissectable but normally the ida and pingala is the one which takes this ojas and because of which our entire functioning is happening in case of a yogi he is able to drive this fluid or this energy or the ojas through sushumna the middle nadi ida is left pingala is right sushumna is in the center which is like a hollow tube normally lying dormant but in case of a yogi he propels the fluid he propels the ojas the viryam through the sushumna and that is called as sushumna nadi pradiptata once that happens it starts raising rising upwards as it rises it does what is called as grantha bhedi grantha bhedana so we have chakra bhedana so there are chakras shad chakras each chakra gets 
bedanam and with each chakra bedanam the yogi achieves higher and higher state and higher and higher siddhis now some people describe as ojas are being turned into sushumna into kundalini jagruti some people do not talk about ojas at all they directly talk about the nadis so kundalini shastra talks about ida pingala sushumna and from swadhisthan to sastrar chakra so some total of this is when utmost amount of restraint is done by the brahmachari the brahmachari means not only the one who is not interested in you know physical act etc but the one who has actually done even the control of thoughts in such case the ojas because it is not utilized anywhere in diffracting the energy outside the whole energy starts piling up and there is an enormous store of energy in the body that energy is then directed to inward concentration which in theoretical terms happens to be jagruti of the kundalini and this is not just a theoretical thing sir it has been described word by word by ramakrishna paramahamsa up to the level of manipur chakra people were writing it on a notepad ramakrishna was describing but he could describe only up to manipur after that he went into samadhi so nothing beyond manipur has been described by human vaikhari vacha but ramakrishna paramahamsa maharaj the maharaj of par excellence has been living example of what happens precisely inside the body now the question is why is it the anatomical scientist cannot see this because it is not a physical structure it is something that is seen and felt by the yogi in the higher states that is why in case of a khechari mudra the person doesn't require to eat because a small drop of elixir fluid that goes in khechari mudra from through the through the palate pouring down into the throat is enough to sustain without food for ages now this is something if you i i have dissected myself the brain and everything as a part of medical student i did not see anything of that kind because it's not to be seen it is something that is made available to the yogi with a higher pragna hari om could it be perceived as a as a you know is it a purification of energy or is it a purification of the seminal fluid it results in you know i'm just trying to get a finer i mean this what you have described is exactly the way it is in the books but i mean and we are you know not at that state so we cannot experience it but uh, is would it be you know is it energy is it liquid is it what form is it that uh, no it's very simple even if today if i ask you a question are you feeling energetic you say yes i say show me your energy you can't what it means is it is the consciousness the prana is something which cannot be exhibited through the sense organs but the prana does exist the prana means energy energy does exist because we this is called as karyanurupa karyanurupa means i am able to move my hand that means i have energy so because of this effect that i moved the hand i know the existence of the prana but if you ask me you know no first show me the energy and then show the exhibition of energy i can't do that why because prana is energy energy cannot be perceived by the sense organs but energy can be perceived through its effects so similarly a yogi when he has done chitta shuddhi and everything and no diffraction of uh, ability to concentrate has been developed then the mind because it is not fettering itself mind well about 25 to 35% of our energy calories are consumed by brain alone this is from medicine i am talking why is it that the brain is consuming 35% it is not walking anywhere the thoughts consume energy 35% of the calorie so if thoughts are consuming the energy that means the prana when the thoughts are not there too many what will happen to the energy it will remain unutilized it will be accumulated this accumulated energy is then utilized for the opening of provided it is directed in that manner through the abhyas of the yoga so seminal fluid is always pure there is nothing impure even if you take the most dastardly person the seminal fluid is pure because the fluid has nothing to do with it fluid is a vehicle fluid is a vehicle 
श्वास एयर ऑक्सीजन इज अ व्हीकल वॉट इज सिटिंग ऑन द व्हीकल इज प्राण सो दैट इज वाय इम्परसेप्टिबल इज प्राण इंटेंजिएबल इज प्राण टेंजिएबल इज श्वास but because they are associated yogis got it right in the beginning that they caught hold of that idea oh if the prana is coming through the breath concentrate on the breath because on this the prana is focusing so that is how the prana ayam pranayam came into the picture in fact as we move forward now patanjali yoga shastra is going to focus on pranayam and it is a favorite subject of vivekananda so on yoga shastra patanjali whatever he has written in his book in raja yoga when it comes to pranayama the master yogi vivekananda goes full blown and then he gives commentary in two three pages otherwise even for this particular sutra he has spoken not more than four lines hari dhanyawad dhanyawad now i have a question if you have time ji ji it is purely uh, no, an academic um i the nirvana shatakam written by adi shankara acharya um uh, uh, talk about uh, the uh, uh, there are two lines uh, in the second uh, stanza of nirvana shatakam it says nacha prana saudnyo navai pancha vayu ho nava sapta dhatu ho nava pancha kosha he is talking about sapta dhatu yeah. Where is in your lecture you mentioned Ashta Dhatu? Is it that he has combined two Dhatus together to make you know seven he, rather than eight? No, when he says say seven, many people do not consider Ojas as a Dhatu. They they consider only Rasa Rakta Mausa Meda Asti Majja Shukra, and Ojas is not considered as a Dhatu by many people because Ojas, if it is Tej, Ojas is considered as Tej. tej is not considered dhatu because it is the essence of essences so some people are of the opinion that tej is not a dhatu but tej is the essence of essences so that is why in the stricter parlance of ved i mean i'm talking of vedanta sapta dhatu in case of ayurveda ashta dhatu because ojas is considered as immunity now most of the other tissues can be exhibited can you exhibit immunity you cannot you cannot specifically pinpoint this is immunity immunity is a overall structure but may the mouse asthi you can say this is muscle this is nerve so be, that is why because of its intangibility ojas is many a times not considered as a dhatu by vedanta but is considered as a dhatu by ayurveda and in case of patanjali maharaj he is silent about how many dhatus are there he just says dhatu rasakarana vaishamyam that's all so there is just a technical difference between the two hari okay. dhanyawad hari